Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander. And today I just wanted to give you some Q&A answers. Recently, I have had a lot of clients come in and ask some really, really great questions about e-commerce, about Amazon, about whatnot. I'm selling on whatnot now and just have a lot of different questions about that. And so I want to filter through some of those. I love being able to coach people and help them. But sometimes the saddest part about that is that y'all don't get to hear that. You don't get to hear some of the amazing questions and amazing answers for some of my clients. And due to pri proprietary information, I'm not one of those that's going to uh, publicize or post a, a coaching call without my clients knowing that. There's just some proprietary information and people want to be open and honest in their coaching calls and not always share those with the words. So there's kind of private information, right? So I do want to share some of the questions though that come through coaching calls so that I can help the masses with these questions. Because I'm guessing if my clients have these questions, then some of you guys do as well well and I just want to make sure that you're prepared to succeed in all the different platforms and prepared to succeed with wholesale bundles because you know me I'm going to be honest with you it's not all sunshines and rainbows here no business is newsflash uh, there is no easy street on the road to success there's no such thing there's going to be roadblocks, there's going to be pitfalls, there's going to be damage and debris, there's going to be amazing opportunities and big paydays and some pay dirt and all kinds of stuff. But I will never ever promise you that there's going to be a straight road on easy street because if someone's telling you that such a thing exists, they are not telling the truth. They're not giving you the background, they're not giving you the information, they're not giving you what it took for them to succeed. They're simply telling you hey, I made all this money or I did all this, th all these things and this is my result. But they didn't tell you how long, how far, how much failure did it take? How much money did it take? How much all that kind of stuff? Full transparency, y'all. Business isn't easy. But then again, life's not easy. Working for a job and working for the man and working for nine to five and doing a commute and having a pay ceiling that you can't break through isn't easy either. So why sugarcoat it? Why sit here and try to lie and try to tell everybody, hey, this is just easy, fast, passive. No, don't buy it. Do not buy it. If someone is telling you all those things, they're great. I love marketing. Of course, there's so many marketers out there, the sketchy, slimy ones. And when you're being smoothed over or schmoozed or whatever, but that's because people want to buy the dream, right? They want the dream, they want the result, they want it now. And that's great, so do I. But as you get into the thick of it, you'll realize it doesn't come now. The results that you want are down the road once you start walking on the road. They're there, they're there for the taking, but it's never going to be smooth. And I think that just prepares you. If you know what to expect, it's not as scary or hard. If you really think, oh my gosh, things are gonna go great and it's just gonna go straight up the elevator and then you hit a roadblock, you're gonna be frustrated and mad and upset. I mean, you're gonna be that anyway, probably. And that's totally cool and human and we all feel that. But the reality is expecting realistic results keeps us even. It keeps us from being up, down, left, always worrying, always wondering when we're just putting the right efforts in. So this is really about steering your mindset in the right direction when it comes to starting, stopping, and continuing anything. And so I just wanted to encourage you with those words that if you're going through hard times, if you're going through struggles, if you're going through things and roadblocks and things that are just getting in your way and you're beating your head against the wall and you're like, why isn't this working? Why isn't this turning out the way that I wanted to? There's a lot of different questions you can ask yourself to fill in the blanks. First of all, let's just clear the air. Some of the stuff that you're going through is not your fault. You're not in control of certain things. You're definitely not in control of Amazon or their algorithm or their rules or their policies or how fast they check in your inventory or their fees, right? Or even the customers that are buying from you and returning crappy stuff. These things are going to happen. Expect them. 
expect life is short and full of trouble, right? <laughs> Bible says that the life is short and full of trouble. So if you just learn to know that the roadblocks are going to come, not fearing them, just being aware, being aware that it's not a straight line. And some bumps are bigger than others, but they're going to be there. If you all lived life long enough to know that even on the in the best of circumstances, things can fall through, fall flat. What do you do in the meantime? You stay the course. You follow the directions. You keep doing the right things and making the right choices. Because I tell you what doesn't happen. If you decide to do nothing, nothing happens. You can't live on what you did all in the past. Your results six months from now are going to come from what you're doing today. I can't stand today's instant culture. I can't stand it because it gives us such false expectations all the time. We see stuff on Instagram. We're scrolling through five second videos and things that are constantly in our minds. And we're seeing advertisements for all these people that are just killing it. And you can do the same and all this different stuff. And it can be so discouraging because it feels like, why are all these people so much ahead of me? I've been doing it longer. I've been doing it the same amount of time and I'm putting so much more effort into it. How come their results don't look, my results don't look like theirs? First of all, comparison is the thief of joy. So if you're comparing your life, your circumstances, your money, your opportunities to someone else, you're always going to feel like that. Comparison's going to steal your joy. Because guess what? You're not them. You didn't start where they were. You don't have the same skills. You might have similar skills, but every person is different and they approach business in a different way, from a different location, from a different skill set, from a different family, from a different culture, from a different background. So it's actually crazy, ludicrous to actually compare yourself to where other people are. Because there's nothing that's identical. So it's apples to oranges every single time. And what do we know? If you took the wholesale bundle system, we, we have a whole section about talking about apples and oranges comparisons. All about it. Because we need to make sure we're comparing the right things. And the reality is your business, your approach, your business model, what you sell, how you sell it, where you sell it, is never going to be identical to somebody else's. So you can't compare their results their timeline, their energy, their effort, their knowledge to yours. It just doesn't make any sense. We're all individuals. Even if we sat in the same classroom, under the same teachers, under the same thing at the same time, and we brought the same money to the table, we still wouldn't have the same results because yours is going to be different. So when you decide to compare and evaluate which I love to do, evaluating, evaluating yourself, reflecting, looking at your business, mind your business. Listen to a few episodes back when I talked about minding your business, your business, not someone else's, not a side by side of look at this person, look at this, how come I'm not there? Or what do I need to do to get here? Yeah, that's okay. We can foreshadow and look at and be like, okay, I want to step up my game. What do I need to do? All great things it all comes back to you and yours. What do you want? Why are you here? Why did you choose to invest in a business? Why did you choose to come here and do this thing? And don't waste your time or mental energy worrying about what everybody else is doing because guess what? You don't have their life. You have yours. And don't waste a single minute of the life that you have worrying about what somebody else has. If you don't like what you got, Fix it, change it, do better. You can, I totally believe in you. You just have to make the next right choice. If you're not sure what that is, give me a call. I would love to chat with you. I would love to talk to you about where you are in your business. What might the next step be for you? Because you know what? You might be shocked by my answer. Do you know how many times that I've had to sit face to face with a client after working with them for a time and then realizing, entrepreneurship just might not be for you. That's hard, but it's also can be true. Some people just aren't meant to be their own boss or they haven't developed the skills necessary to be self-disciplined and to be motivated and to do that, but they would never not show up if they were at a job. 
It's a totally different thing. Some people, for example, I'll give you an example of my own children, right? I, I know they're never going to listen or watch this, so that's great. I can talk about them. <laughs> and it's not a bad thing. It's just like an observation. If you have any, I have three kids. My oldest is artistic and ADD and very fast paced, low patience, likes to be busy, works really hard, is responsible, will show up, respectable, all that. But self-motivated? Absolutely not. Working independently, sometimes if he's in control of what and when, maybe he's one of those that needs to show up and do the job and be responsible and be, not be in charge. Doesn't really like to be in charge. He likes to do his thing and he's good at his thing and he likes to do those things. Doesn't like to be in charge. If he left to himself, he just would be overwhelmed, not sure where to start, what to do. He would not be good at being his own boss. He's really good at as long as he's got some creativity he can walk in that direction. My middle child is Miss Independent. She could work on her own just by herself. She doesn't want, she's very responsible, on time, takes care of business, works hard, goes above and beyond, does so many great things. Maybe she gets that from her mom. <laughs> no, seriously though, she, she's an, she would be an excellent employee to anyone else and she works really good independently. She doesn't like people standing over her telling her what to do. She doesn't mean mind following directions but she doesn't want the responsibility of that but she has that entrepreneurship in inside of her meaning like the independence like she would show up for herself she's the one that did her own online homeschool in high school because she just didn't like high school and didn't like all the people and she's very introverted and she she gave me a, a powerpoint presentation on why she wanted to be online homeschooled and this was before covid before it was cool all before it was widespread and they had an option here and she took it but she didn't need me to stand over her. She knew what her responsibilities were. She took care of them. She took pride in that. She performed with excellence, things like that. So she definitely has that. But just using that from two, say, two kids from the same family that just don't, they, everyone's different. And so I just use that as a comparison to let you know and encourage you in certain ways. You can still be an entrepreneur for an agency to where you run your own segment of something, but someone else is in charge of the payroll or bringing in the clients or things like that. So that's, I call it, I wish I knew that if there was an actual real word for this, but it's a freelancer, but not fully entrepreneurs. So like your consultancy or your work for an agency, but you have your own workload and you bring your own clients or things like that. I don't know. There is something for everyone though. That's the exciting part about online business. Is it if e-commerce isn't for you, there's lots of other options, writing your own books, being a freelancer, being a VA, customer service, starting your own service-based business, accounting, taxes, insurance, so many things, an influencer, affiliate marketer, there's networker, there's just so many different options for you. So if you're ever confused and you're ever like, okay, I totally wanna to get out of this, but I don't know where to turn and I don't know what to do, we'd be happy to help you and assess your skills and see what, type of online business is right for you because maybe this isn't. And if it is, that's great too. What are you going to do to stop comparing yourself and instead get to work doing the thing? Because that's really important. Comparison will steal your joy, make you feel like crap, make you feel like you're at the bottom of every barrel. And how are you going to get out of that? So number one, if there are things that are causing you to compare yourself and to feel down and to feel like you should be farther along the road by now. Stop and assess what you're comparing yourself to. What is your, what is the standard by which you're measuring? And please don't let it be perfection because that's unobtainable, right? Especially in a business like Amazon FBA or e-commerce when there's no standards. There's no, okay, if you've arrived here, there's no C-suite to where, hey, you've arrived when you're making six figures and you're in the corner office. That's corporate and that's great. But in, in entrepreneurship, the ceiling is as high as you want it to be or as low as you want it to be. There is no parameters or boundaries around yourself. It's unlimited, which is also scary and overwhelming. Who sets the standards? What am I supposed to do? If you're coming from a background like that into entrepreneurship, it's a huge shift. 
you're used to performance reviews and someone telling you this is your job requirements and someone else's paycheck on the bottom line, somebody else's signature on the bottom line, your paycheck. So they get to call the shots. They get to decide we've changed our corporate rules and this is what you have to do now. So when you're coming from that into entrepreneurship, there's definitely a jump. So these are all things in, I just want you to consider and think about. And y'all, you know this, right? When I'm telling you these things, it's because I need to hear them too. I am not exempt from letting comparison steal my joy either. Which is why I have to say this out loud and say it to you. And we're all in the same boat. So pick up your oar and let's row together because comparison's a real thing and it just will steal every good thing that we brought to the table if we let it. But today on this day, we're not going to because we're going to say, you know what? I'm farther than I was last year. No matter what's happening around me to the who, what, when, where, and all the conferences and all the people and all them saying, oh, I've got all these big numbers and my brand just took off and got picked up by Target. And okay, awesome. Celebrate other people and don't let it get you down. Instead, let it inspire you and motivate you and make you realize that's possible because they did it. So what about me? How can I make that possible for me? Don't let it get you down and be like, wow, look at them. They got their brand and target. I'll never get there. I'm never going to be blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? That negative self-talk goes over and over. And you've got to say no more. No more to it. No more. You may not be in my brain. Instead, when you're tempted to be comparison and to get down on yourself and thinking maybe you're going to quit, okay, entertain it. Think about it. What do you stand to lose? What do you stand to gain? Because you get to decide at the end of the day, full permission. You get to decide at the end of the day, what's best and what's right for you and your business and how you're gonna steer your ship. So just keep that in mind when you're ever tempted to compare yourself to other people's. All right, now let's get to those coaching questions because I know that's what I said at the beginning and I went on this rabbit trail about just encouraging you and inspiring you to really stop comparing yourself and really just celebrate and reflect on all of the things that you've done even so far. We're mid-February, right? Mid-February, six weeks or so into the year. What have you accomplished so far? Because I know you just didn't sit on your hands the whole time and did absolutely nothing. Look at what you've done so far. What do you want to do more of? What did you want to, what did you do that you didn't want to do anymore? And is it possible to eliminate that or outsource it in some sort of way? And if not, how can you find joy in it? Because if it's not going to go away, you might as well just change your attitude about it. Right? Ah, oh, y'all. Let's just be honest. I hate the dishes. Hate them. Don't want to do them. And yet, every single day in the household of five, there's dishes. And then when you cook, there's more dishes. <laughs> and then when you clean up, you empty the dishwasher and there's already dishes in the sink. They just don't go away. And so, yeah, I could hire somebody or one of my kids or force all of somebody else to, to do the dishes. It's just technically my job. Allie en enter, like, empties the dishwasher sometimes and things like that, but everyone's got all their own sets of responsibilities and that one's just the one that I do the most. So it's fine. I'm not going to outsource it. It's just something that's a daily chores. It doesn't really take that long, but I still don't like it. So I just try to find joy in it because it's not that long of a task. It's just necessary, right? So I'm not saying, oh my gosh, the dishes are joyful. I'm just looking at it like, what can I do to make this a better experience? Because I got to do it anyway. So I could be grumpy about it and be like, oh my gosh, I hate the dishes and it's so gross and it stinks and blah, 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 right? And just have this bad attitude because I have to do it. Or I can approach it with gratitude. I am thankful that I have dishes to wash. I am thankful that I have a dishwasher. I wash a lot of stuff by hand because for many years our dishwasher was broken and our, before we did our kitchen. And my kids grew up hand washing dishes. I think it's a great skill for them to learn, by the way, because they just never go away. It's like we talked about dishes and laundry will never leave you. Even if you're single, even if you have no children, you still have to do your own dishes and your own laundry. And it's just the way it goes. You can't cook in a paper pot. <laughs> so as much as you want to eliminate most, I love paper plates and paper cups and all that kind of stuff and blah, blah, blah. 
But the reality is we're going to dirty up some pans. We're going to have to, dishes are just part of life. So instead I can be grateful that I have a wonderful kitchen to wash dishes in and a family to wash dishes for. And so I put on praise music and I just do the dishes. And I'm saying, you know what? I don't like this job. And I put on my pink gloves because my hands, y'all, they get so yucky. So uh -uh, I put on my pink gloves and I'm just like, I'm just going to do this thing. And I'm joyful and grateful, at least somewhere in my heart, half of me over here. So oh, I don't like this, um, but making the best of it because what are my other options? Don't do them. And then they pile up and get nasty and smell and gross. Hire someone. That one's not exactly hireable, right? We can hire out the lawn and even maybe the laundry because that's something we could done all in one day and over here, but like dishes are just perpetual, constant all the time. So it's just one of those things that I can't get rid of. So think about that too, in your business and in your life, how can you make a task that you can't outsource, that you can't push off to someone else, that you can't get rid of, just make it more joyful. Be grateful. That's part of it. Just being grateful and thankful that you have dishes to wash in a warm, cozy, comfortable house. And even if you have a tiny one bedroom apartment, you have that, you have that. And we can be grateful for even the day-to-day -day stuff that we have because we don't like to think about it, but there's a lot of people in the world that don't have even a fraction of what we do. And so instead of feeling guilty or shameful or anything like that about it, we feel gratitude. May not have much, but I'm thankful for what I do have can change our whole perspective. All right. One of the questions that I've been getting recently is I've launched my first bundle. How long do I wait before I don't get any sales before changing something in the listing? So if you have launched a bundle and you haven't received any sales or sales seem to be super slow, that's going to differ between each person. Like what's a super slow sale to you might be a super fast sale to someone else. We don't know. So that's going to be subjective and it depends on your own volume, whether you're new, whether you just started, whether you have brand registry, like just all the different things. So like, how long do you wait after you've launched a product before you say no one's seeing this and that? First of all, most, a lot of people's answer is like, how, or, or how long, when do I put PPC on if it's not moving? Okay. And one of the first things that you need to think about with your Amazon listings is that throwing PPC at a listing doesn't automatically create sales. It's just not that simple. First of all, you have to have an optimized listing. You have to have the right keywords and be seen and indexing on Amazon for those keywords. Even if you're on page 412, I don't know if there's that many, you have to be optimized for that. So what I mean by that is the first thing you do when you're not having sales is not change your price or add PPC. For the people in the back that didn't hear that clearly, I'm going to say it again. Why? Because this is so dang important and it comes up all the time with the students, with people in the group from YouTube and people are asking me, okay, I launched a product, a bundle, like whether it's a bundle or a wholesale or anything that's new to Amazon, a new ASIN. So that's across the board, whether it's private label, white label, you brought something from retail arbitrage to the table and it's brand new listing, any brand new listing, whether it's a bundle or not. The first thing to do if you're not receiving sales is to make sure you're being seen on Amazon. So when I say being seen, that means you're indexing for your keywords. So if you have Helium 10, you can go ahead and check your indexing for this. But if you don't, what you need to do is go into some sort of incognito browser or um, private browsing of some sort. Because if you do it from your own store and computer and IP address, like Amazon knows that. And so they don't want to show you your own listing sometimes. Y'all, the algorithm at Amazon is like craziness. No one has it all nailed and figured out. Why? Because they change it all the time. So just be aware of that. But first of all, they don't like to show you your own listing unless that's the only thing that ranks for those keywords. So they're smart enough. The bots, the algorithm is smart enough to know that this is yours. And so they, you don't want to buy your own item. 
So they know that. And so this is something that we've tested in different places. I've had friends from across the country do like a certain test that I'm doing and they see a different product than I see when we type in the same exact keywords. And there's reasons for this and we'll get into it. But one of the first things you need to realize with your listings is that your price and PPC are not going to solve all of your visibility problems with your listing. You have to make sure that you are swimming in the right pond with your keywords. So I'm gonna give you an example of an item that a client of mine has. Now I'm not gonna show you this because I feel like it's not fair to them to show you their listing and their store and all this stuff without their permission. But what I will show, share with you is the keywords that made all the difference in their bundle. So they had this bundle, it's a stationary set, it's for a little girl, it's for um, like mid-age girls, like probably eight to 13 or something like that. And it comes with stickers and stamps and pens and a notebook. And it's just like this whole cool journal stationary set type thing. But, it, and it's all described well, the listing is optimized pretty well. But the problem is the competition is so vast in this area that there's just no way they're going to be seen but through all of the different pages. Does that mean that listing is dead in the, well, because guess, here's the thing. If they left the listing as it is, which is actually pretty good, I think it got like an eight or nine on Helium 10. So it's a well-optimized listing with great keywords for the fit of it, right? Here's the thing. If your item is, or your bundle, your ASIN is in a competitive niche, number one, why? <laughs> I want you to help try to diversify your products and choose something that's in a different niche so that it's not so competitive. We don't want to throw our hat into the ring of a really competitive niche unless we have something innovative. Your iPhone case is probably only going to be seen by attributes. What I mean by that is iPhone case you're not going to rank for. But if you have a pink sparkly iPhone case, that's what's going to sell your product. Attributes sell products. So what I also call is rewording your listing. So back to the stationery. I took a look at this listing for this client and immediately what stuck out to me was you're never going to be seen on page one with these keywords because they're way too competitive. And I got down to page eight or nine, didn't see their listing and realized like all of these different bundles that are here you're going to have a really hard time competing with these keywords. So we don't change the product. We change the title. We change who we're marketing this product to. So that's what we did. We reworked this listing. And instead we looked at merchant work and looked at similar keywords. So I use relatedwords.org um, to look at similar keywords and think, how can we reframe this title to be in a less competitive niche without changing what you're offering? So that's what we did. Not every listing's dead in the water. You don't have to pull it and be like, oh, it's too competitive. I guess I lost all my money on this. Instead, we can figure out how to market this product to a different set of customers, okay? So what we did and what we came up with was pen pal stationery or pen pal accessories. And this can change the game. Now the test is being done right now. So I unfortunately can't give you the results yet. So stay tuned. Hopefully we can get into the future and they can get a few sales by changing this. So this was very recent. I'm just sharing it with you because they really struggled with some of these things. And all it takes is a, another set of eyes to look at it and say, what else can we call this that hits a different target market, but it's the same product. And I, I, I maybe most of you guys are thinking, what is she talking about? Okay, so the title was stationary journal notebook set for girls and then listed all the different attributes and it comes with the stickers and all the stuff, right? But when you realize that and you type that into like merchant words and you look at how many people are searching for that, quite a few, it was like six or 7,000 people per month are looking for those items. So that's great. That's a good search volume. But then you go to Amazon and that there's, 27 plus there was like a lot of pages a lot of pages. i think it was on page eight or nine or so so however many they put on each page times that a lot hundred I mean, hundreds of listings i didn't count them nine pages worth of listings and i still didn't find theirs under journal notebook stationary set for girls but when you type in pen pal stationary set you see a whole different set of products and lo and behold, 
There's a whole no competition, hardly. There's a few bundle sets here and there, mostly are geared towards adults. And I found one on page two that was similar to theirs. And it was like, oh, this is how you need to change your title in order to market to these people. Why? Because there's less competition in these people and it still fits the description. Pen pal supplies are simply papers, pens, no, but paper, uh, envelopes and stickers and all the whatnot, but that's the whole thing. It's still the same product. We're just calling it something else and marketing it to a niche that no one else is thinking of. Pen pal, there's not very many people. They will end up on page one when they start ranking for this keyword because they weren't even on page nine just keep going and going i stopped at page nine and i was like okay you're not you're not indexing very well at all with this and page nine is enough to know that we need to do something different and so their first question was should we lower our price should we put some ppc on it no why because that wouldn't have helped they lowered their price no one's seeing it no one's even clicking on their listing and if you go that to check that you can look at your back end your reports and impressions are basically like your clicks right? How many people are seeing your product? And then the click-throughs and the page views are like the click-throughs, right? So how many people are actually even seeing it? Is it coming across their search results? And secondly, are they clicking? If you see that no one's clicking and no one's really seeing and you don't have any impressions, changing your price doesn't help. No one knows you're there. It's almost like putting a boutique in a back alley. Beautiful boutique, have amazing products, amazing prices, amazing staff, the best boutique you ever could have imagined. But you don't know it's there because it's location in some back alley that you have to turn four different ways to go to. People don't feel safe. They don't know where it is. They can't find it. So it's not worth it to go there. They're not even seeing it. So lowering your price in your back alley, unseeable boutique is ludicrous, right? Because no one is even seeing your boutique. You're not even giving people to come in the door. You have to get them to come in the door before they can purchase. So this whole thing is about getting them through the door. How do you get people through the door on Amazon? How do you get them to see your item and click on it? That's price aside at that point. You need visibility. In order to get visibility for your product, you have to use the right keywords. You want to be the big fish in the small pond. You don't want to be Nemo in the ocean. You're never going to, (laughs) I hate my puns here, but I can't help myself. You're never going to find you in the big ocean without tons and tons and tons of search. Who, how many of you go past page nine when you're looking for a product to buy on as a buyer? Page nine, that's a lot of pages to click through to realize you didn't find anything that you liked, anything that was worth purchasing. And then when that happens and people are looking for that and they look at your listing and then don't buy, that's even worse because then Amazon's, oh, these keywords, these people clicked on this, didn't buy it. So now they're, oh, that maybe doesn't match that. Their algorithm already picks up on that. So changing your price or throwing money at a bad listing, remember your back alley boutique? If you put money in a bigger sign, you're still not seen in the back alley. You need to be on Main Street, right? Y'all, I just want to help you get on Main Street. That's all I'm trying to do here. Merchant Words is my favorite tool. MommyIncome.com forward slash Merchant Words. You can always get a good deal there. Yes, that's an affiliate link. Thank you and you're welcome because you usually get a better deal when you use that. But before you consider PPC or changing your price, make sure your listings popping up make sure that you're on the first few pages that you don't have 14 different competitors there and if you do it doesn't mean you have to pull it all and donate it to the salvation army instead you have to think outside the box so we're turning a journal notebook stationery set for girls into a pen pal accessory kit which has a little bit less search volume but less competitors. So you're already positioning yourself to be on page one because there just isn't very many other products available during into that thing. And this is what I teach and preach all the time. Be the big fish in a small pond. So 
these clients don't have to recall their stuff and liquidate it and sell it all, at least not now. Instead, they need to work on being seen, work on being seen. And so they asked, how long do you wait before you do that? First, you got to make sure you're being seen. You're using the correct possible keywords with the lowest amount of competition. Y'all, charcuterie, I always say this wrong. It's like a French word. I get it all wrong, but I do it all the time. I have one. I love charcuterie. I love finger food and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of people like don't use that word. They call it a cheese board. If you're using both words, then that can be in both of different places. So they can use journal, notebook set, and also pen pal set. But I would start with the first four keywords being the most important words to bring people to your listing. In order to determine what those are, you need to sit down for a 15 minute hustle and you need to just brainstorm and ask people or ask people in your family, people at your work, people at your church, like wherever, what do you call this? What would you type in to buy this item? If this was the results you wanted, your product, your bundle, is the answer to the question. What's the question? What's the keywords? What are the keywords that I, I pretend I'm your buyer? What is the, what am I gonna type into Amazon to make your product show up on page one of my results? Or page two or any page for those keywords. What will I be typing in? What do you want me to say that brings up your listing? So you really have to think about it. It's not just someone did a Christmas bundle with it's like Christmas socks or something like a Christmas sock bundle, Christmas sock set, cute Christmas socks. What are people going to type in to find your bundle? Are they going to type in cute Christmas socks? Because you know what? You could also title that fun Christmas gifts for women under $10. Do you know that people type that whole phrase into can into um, Amazon? It's a possibility. That's not the sexiest title, obviously. And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, that doesn't fit the algorithm. Y'all, do what you got to do. Amazon's algorithm is tricky and they don't give us all the keys to the kingdom. So we got to figure them out. Test stuff. You've got everything to lose, right? If you've already invested money in it. So you might as well mess with the stuff and then give it some time. Give it some time. When I say time... That seven days to be picked up by the algorithm? Sometimes three days, sometimes a day later when you make a change, it, it's already there. You first need to make your changes that you're making and then double check that you can find your listing either through, again, private browsing or someone else's phone or your work computer or a friend from across the country that you know, just say, hey, can you look this up for me on Amazon and tell me when you find this and don't give them the ASIN, give them the keywords because that would be an organic search. And then if they actually bought one, first of all, don't do this with friends and family because they won't let you leave a review and that's so stupid. And I know it's complicated. My mom left me a review once and I got a policy violation because they said it was like fake review when it really wasn't. It was my own mother, but she also works for the company. So that maybe would have been a problem. Different IP address and different even physical address. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Did I actually answer the question, how long do you wait before you start doing PPC and changing your price? That's not even the answer. That was the wrong question. <laughs> the question is, how do I get people to see my item and buy it? And changing your price in a back alley boutique that doesn't have a sign out on Main Street is not the answer. Now, once you know you're being seen and you have the proper keywords and you're on page one or two, now it might be time to throw PPC, but definitely not changing price. Most people think, oh my gosh, I'll just go in and lower the price and be fine. If you're doing a retail arbitrage item and you've got 15 other sellers on that product and it's being seen regularly, price is definitely something you change first. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about ASINs that you're bringing to the table under your own brand in a brand new ASIN. There's a different protocol for that. So if you're used to just changing prices from online or retail arbitrage type things or even wholesale with other competitors, then absolutely price is gonna get you the buy box, right? Race to the bottom. But when you're talking about your own product, your own ASIN that you brought to the table, price is the last thing I'm messing with. First, it's keywords maybe images, 
maybe making sure that you're indexing and seeing that. If you have Helium 10, you can use index checker. If not, again, I just talked to you guys about the methods by which you execute that. So I hope that this helps. I know it helped them. We sat there and workshopped this a little bit in our coaching call and I saw the light bulbs go off and now we're testing this theory to see um, how many more sales that can generate. Are they going to give it more visibility? Because remember, we couldn't even find them past page nine. We're hoping to get them on page one or two with their new keywords. So just think about outside of the box. This goes back to even years ago and I talked about it. My besties from like the East Coast, Connecticut and now Pennsylvania. And I'm from the Midwest, Michigan area. And even talking about what is a Volkswagen Beetle called? What do you guys call that in your area? I always call it a slug bug. That's just what we called it. And when she was in town one time, she called it a punch buggy and hit me in the shoulder. And I'm like, what in the world? is a punch buggy. I knew when I saw it, like what she was talking about. And I'm like, what planet are you from? Because where I come from, <laughs> we call that a slug bug. And she's like, no, that is a punch buggy. And I'm like, okay, tomato, whatever. But in Amazon world, both of those things matter. How many people are you going to miss out on if you don't call it a punch buggy. So guess what? I'm using both. Same thing with if you're swimming in the big ocean and you've got a big product that's like really saturated, then you can actually just change some keywords and market it in a different way. And lo and behold, you will get more customers. So always think about the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Think about who, what your customer is going to type in in order for your product to be the answer. Those are the keywords you need to use. And if they're really saturated or difficult to get on the first couple of pages, then it's time to go to relatedwords.org, talk to some other people. What way can you reframe this title to make it still fit, but maybe fit into a different niche, like the whole pen pal that was not even anywhere on their radar. So just think about that with your listings and your titles and don't start with price. That's never going to be the answer at first, unless it is one of those things where you've got 100 sellers on a retail arbitrage, Fisher Price, something that you picked up from the store, and you've got to compete on price in order to move that item. That's a totally different scenario. So we're not talking about that. That would be probably price first because you already have the visibility. You're just not getting the sale or the buy box because your price is too high. That's totally a different mindset when you're talking about your own ASIN that you don't have any competitors on. There's no reason to lower your price. No one's competing against you. You're just in the wrong pond. And so that is just the lesson of the day. Number one, comparison. Don't compare. Apples to oranges. And when it comes to competition and your listings, don't lower your price first. You're not even being seen. Be seen first. Make sure you're swimming in the right pond. And then we can talk about PVC and lowering your price. Maybe. PVC first, then lower price. <laughs> That's in that order for a second and third. I hope that helps you and encourages you to move forward and gives you some new light on maybe some dead listings that you have or things you're not sure you might abandon. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. I know y'all could be anywhere else. You have choices with podcasts and mentors and coaches. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of your space. I really appreciate that. See you guys same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.